the killers obviously are, you know, solos, <laughs> as you'd think of them for, in the cyberpunk world. And the idea behind the story initially was I wanted to, because I love Kira Kurosawa films. So I, you know, I wanted to kind of see if I could come up with a way to encapsulate Kurosawa's samurai stylings into a future sci-fi setting. And in order to do that, I had to do a lot of research. And what came of that was that character on the front cover there, who is called Gabriel, a bit uh, antithetical to samurai stuff, but there's a reason for it. And <laughs> I wanted to... <clears throat> I wanted to tell dramatic stories through combat. And so the central premise, as you'll read as you go through the story, is that each battle sequence that Gabriel finds himself in has a narrative underneath it. There's a reason for it. It's not wanton destruction. It becomes centered around purpose, the true sense of a samurai, honor and duty, take the forefront as opposed to just being an assassin, which is kill who you're told to kill. He, um, a brief background, he is the last of a series of cyber-enhanced assassins in that were raised and created by a mega corporation that they engage in a low war system because the overarching government declared lethal weapons, firearms, you know, that sort of thing, to be illegal. So in order to continue to one-up each other, the corporations went back to the feudal-style low war and started training assassins and sword wielders and did so to create a whole subculture of murder that went under the radar these characters, which are called the Holy Eight, they're raised by a man who trains them in individual styles of combat. They're enhanced by the sciences that this mega corporation have been trying to perfect for decades. And the, there's a no whole overarching purpose that would be a huge spoiler to the story, so I'm not going to go there. But Gabriel himself is the last one. And in doing so, the man who trained and raised him after working with all these other versions said the best way to control this person is cut them off from society. So Gabriel spends all of his life as a killer for this mega corporation, sent out to kill and then to return and to associate with no one. So he lives this extremely monkish life of eat, sleep, train, kill. So this wasn't until, at all inspired by the pandemic. No, not necessarily, but it did sort of parallel that. It was an intentional. Right, what you know? Um, <laughs> maybe a little bit of inspiration, but it was totally unintentional inspiration. And then the... As the book begins, you know, his whole life changes. And when you read it, you'll understand why. As far as the superhero, that was that whole premise, Legacy of Heroes, was written as a good night kiss to subverted superheroism. The idea that every superhero is a flawed human that is either irredeemable or just can't get over it or whatever. And every villain has a tragic backstory and all that nonsense. Um, I designed those characters and specifically the one on the cover to be unique and interesting, but also cleave to old golden age tropes. So that young man on the cover is, wants to be a golden age superhero. He wants to be like the one that saved him. And that's part of his backstory. He wants to carry on the legacy of this man that saved his life, who also happened to die tragically because of it. And when he 
gains his own superpowers, he immediately wants to go out and do good for the world. Not for any other purpose than to be a good person doing good in the world. And that inspires other people to become better versions of themselves too, like a big ripple effect. Now, that's something I dwell on a lot. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm... I come, because I come from horror, I do like the, I enjoy the tragic stories. Oh, the villain was he? Did, what did he mean to be bad, or did just the world make him bad? I like those stories. That being said, the fact that that became the overarching theme of comics and you know comics and film for the length of time that it did, I I don't want to say it's done irreparable damage, but it's it's taken away from what comics kind of have always to me represented. And it's, it's why my favorite villain in a movie ever is uh, the villain from the movie gamer. The gamer is not a great movie. That being said, Michael C. Hall makes the perfect villain for me because there's no tragic backstory. There's no, there's no undercutting. He just represents bad. He represents evil. He represents world domination like it's there was no oh hey no plot to rob a bank or steal some money it was literally just i want to control everybody on the planet and i'm going to make that happen and to me it represented what classic comic book villains were they were an archetype for bad for evil for wrongdoing and it's why dc to me screws up Superman so bad today because they're trying to have Superman in a world where Superman can't just represent the ultimate good. No one, Superman isn't supposed to be a reality. Superman is supposed to be the ideal. He's supposed to be what we all aspire to be. Or, you know, in my case, growing up, I wanted to be the kingpin. The idea being they're archetypes. They're the things that you aspire to but can't ever reach. You know, it's... You know, in Christian mythology, you have the saints. You have all kinds of things. You know, there's these archetypes and that. But in, like, the modern world, this was our way of telling those old stories again in a way that made sense to us. 